welcome. And um, look, I, um, I have um, been in and out of the education sector for uh, a number of years, and I have watched and uh, been, I, I think, at the, the helm driving a lot of um, the 3D printing um, courses, uh, adoption, uh, the technology into various schools uh, and educational environments. So I hope that um, what I can talk about today will, will really um, inform you all and, and uh, provide some, um, some information on maybe getting, getting started if, 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 you're, if you're looking to get started and certainly um, um, manage some, some better um, effective 3D printing um, um, structures around using your technology to its maximum and, and getting the best out of it. All right, so um, yes, you know, the first thing I really wanted to talk about was um, basically the, um, oh, I'm sorry, hang on a second, I'm just going to, Dominic, are, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, check out. Uh, I just, uh, I'm new to the webinar um, scenario, so I'm just going to have to check with Dominic here. Dominic, can, is my um, my control panel in the middle of the screen, is that is that visible or is that just something on the side that, uh, that I only see? It's just something on the side that only you see. I'm um, oh, sorry, say that again? It's only on the side that you see. No one else will see the control panel. All right. Okay, great. Okay, good. Sorry about that. I was just in the middle of the screen. <laughs> I was worried everybody was uh, couldn't see the screen. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, okay, so yeah, so we'll get started and, and uh, talk about uh, you know achieving the best outcomes for for teachers and students in in the school. So I'll just uh, actually go back here and run this one. I might have to drop in and out here. Okay, so yeah, the first thing you know I wanted to, to start off with, and many of you are possibly oh, sorry about this. I've, I'm going to have to zoom in, and we'll just run it from here, slide by slide. <laughs> sorry about this, folks. I've got the automation on, and I'll just take this down to maybe 75 percent. There we go. Okay, um, yeah. So primary education. We'll start from the ground up because I think that's probably where a lot of the learning is, is really taking place um, in its foundation and, and the students that are, are really introduced to this kind of technology and its, its, creative, its creativity aspect are really going through their education, you know, their 12 years and beyond into university with significant advantage. And, and so, you know, some of the things in, in primary education that 3D printing introduces to students is, is certainly the... Um, not so much the design um, skills, but it certainly is uh, teaching those three-dimensional um, skills in, in objects, and it introduces students uh, to the STL format, which is the surface tessellation language file format in which um, you know, all 3D printers use to create their objects. So there's a lot of um, really good benefit to just you know, grabbing things and saying, this is what I want to make, and the students making them and uh, putting them putting them uh, forward as a as a sort of an explanation or a reasoning for their learning, having to explain things, how things work, how things function. It also really, um, I think, takes an advantage in that it really gets students thinking about plastics and polymers. And certainly with the, the variety of, and mostly in education, we see a lot of desktop printers, um, the, the variety of uh, materials that are available in that desktop realm, you know, through, through MakerBot and other manufacturers, uh, which include, you know, PLA uh, material, which is, you know, quite uh, advantageous in that it's... Um, uh, biodegradable. So there's some really good advantages there that students are being introduced to things that are um, uh, ver biodegradable versus, you know, basically what's going in the landfill. So there's great things happening there. How 3D printers operate, and uh, you, I do it often. I, I have three small children, and I'm often asked to come in with my 3D printers and, and make stuff for the classrooms. And the the, the gravity that these machines 
um, take on the class. You know, everybody is just mesmerized by this ability to take something, an image, a design on a computer, and this machine makes it. it it's just fantastic, and, and kids are just all over it. They're just, they want, they crave more information, they crave more knowledge. Um, they, they really embark on a really good um, adventure in education, in manufacturing and design and make. So there's, um, there's really, really good applications in, in junior education, uh, you know, in the primary levels. Um, for example, students choosing their history characters and um, sites like Thingiverse and other file repositories, which are, you, can, you can acquire these files for free, are a fantastic way for students to engage in creating a character of history that they really enjoy and presenting a three-dimensional object with their presentation that they're doing. It's, um, it's fantastic. My kids do it all the time. We just went through book week up here in Queensland. Uh, very popular kids dressing up in costumes, uh, choosing their favorite book, dressing up as the characters, and uh, my kids 3D print you know, their characters characters from their books um, as close as they can um, and uh, hang them as, a, as an emblem where they put them on their backpacks when they go to school and other students, stu teachers are, are looking at uh, developing this kind of uh, book week um, theme around making things around their, their book interests. Um, science in the junior primary levels, uh, introduction of uh, basic machines like the catapult that I've got on the, the slideshow here, um, you know, students getting into, well, choosing a catapult, um, making, 3D printing, making their, their con and constructing, putting together their catapults and testing and analyzing. There's no design requirement here. Kids uh, do not need to get in and uh, learn those skills just yet, but it's a great introduction to 3D printing, making, and uh, applying a functional machine to a purpose. Um, maps of the world, three-dimensional maps, those sort of things. It, it's, a, it's a great space. It's really taking shape in the primary levels. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen it uh, through, through my own children's education and also, of course, we, we do it a, a bit at home as well. All right. So just, um, you know, it's, it's a tough... It's a, it's a tough environment uh, to actually choose the right printer for your school. It can be quite daunting, you know, over, and it, it continues to grow, but there's over 140 different manufacturers of desktop printers. Um, certainly, you know, there's, there's um, players on the market that have been there the longest and, and are, are sure things, but there's also cheaper newcomers to the market. Um, how do you choose uh, these printers? It, it's, it, it can be quite daunting. So, you know, from, from my experience, um, you, you certainly do choose a player that's been around for a while and they've really started working out their bugs. And, um, you know, going with the cheapest uh, is not always the best option, although it gets you a 3D printer in the classroom and it gets it running. Um, I think there's some things that probably teachers need to really take into consideration uh, on choosing, you know, products. And, and it, it comes down to what is your time worth, right? Generally speaking, a more uh, certainly professional 3D printers, uh, like the Stratasys line, um, you're, you, you, you do pay um, some extra for those types of machines, but um, they're, they're guaranteed to work. I, you know, I've, I've, I do have those in an educational environment and they just work seamlessly. And then as you start looking down into the price bracket, certainly um, you do get into more labor intensive features that uh, require more, more handling. Handling of the print, um, cleaning of the nozzles, uh, cleaning of the bed, uh, you know, you're going to lose some prints because they become unstuck from the bed because the, the, the levels where the nozzle meets the, the platform needs calibrating and leveling. So there is a, a, a bit of labor intensiveness to it. And so, you know, choosing a, a player that's been on the market for a while, they've certainly worked out a lot of their bugs and they continue to cut new ground, making printing space larger, the volume of the prints better, um, 
uh, you know, like the uh, the curing of the 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 model, so that they don't they don't fracture while you're building tall models. Sometimes the material tends to break apart. Those sort of things are really uh, issues that need to be managed uh, by the the usually the teacher or the instructor. And at this level in in the primary schools, certainly um, it it is on the teacher to manage these. So um, you know, there's hopefully there'll be some questions for it on, on you know, how, how to get started or if you're already started, where to go to from there. We can certainly answer those questions later on in the webinar. So um, moving into middle school education, you know, the years seven through nine primarily, there's some, there's some really interesting things going on. You know, there's, you know, some schools are waiting to get started in this space. Other schools have just taken it and run with it. Um, from from my experience for it and, and the schools that I've I've been with, um, certainly the opportunity now because we're at middle school, we are now introducing that design element where students are introduced to a, a CAD program, regardless of, of of what it is. But this all programs nowadays all convert files over to an STL, which is read by the three D printer. So. This is the introduction of this whole creativity phase, and, and probably you know previous to to the um, in, in the primary level, we are sourcing files and printing them, and there's not much um, uh, design aspect to it. But now we start introducing that. So you know things like I've just got on the slide here a lot of the the middle school. Um, elements that are involved in 3D printing are asking students to solve their everyday problems. Gadgets, broken things, can't find a part, parts are too expensive, uh, it's too old. Um, what do I have? You know, a great example here is a flashlight holder and what a popular 3D printing exercise this is. Because every student is going to have their own flashlight, different length, different weight, different size, different diameter, and their challenges are to, you know, design and make a holder to fit on, in this case, a bike handlebar, right, a backpack, um, a backpack holder, or maybe a snap fitting, those sort of things. So these are the kind of projects that really get students creatively thinking, going on an adventure in design, and uh, and from my experience, you, you put on a course in middle school education where they're introduced to elements of design through a CAD soft package and 3D printing their objects. It, the, the numbers that want to go on and continue in that are, 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 are ballooning. They, they, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, traditionally, you know, running manufacturing technology courses, you know, in a in a certain district or a community, uh, those numbers are pretty steady. The ones that go into engineering, the ones that go into architecture, the ones that go into medicine. Um, but in in manufacturing, technical education involving 3D printing, those numbers, uh, from my experience, are just um, ballooning. So you know, there's a lot of uh, um, aspects in this year, you know, starting off in year seven, working its way through to year nine, where you start introducing more design and creativity elements and um, and different uh, challenges to 3D printed projects. Make it better, make it matter, and certainly design and make with purpose. Um, those are things that are really re relevant to students these days. Um, they're not all doing the same thing, and they're all customizing. Uh, and as it is in the age of customization, uh, an object that pertains to their particular need. And this is great for folio work as well. You know, students um, in their folio contributions now are needing to justify the reason for a design. And when it's personal, when it fits for a purpose, when it strengthens a need, um, the folio mark or grade um, certainly goes up because they've, they've met that justification. Um, design uh, variation through studies lo looking at Thingiverse and, and at this stage probably um, Thingiverse is, is quite relevant and of course Thingiverse is a MakerBot, um, uh, I guess a, a, a portion of, of MakerBot, they created Thingiverse and it's a file repository 
where you can go in and you can drag out any kind of file of any theme from dinosaurs to uh, medical files to you name it, anything, small little robots, and uh, make things, connectors, gadgets. The real relevance to Thingiverse as we move into middle school years where we're asking students to design and make their own things, it's important for students to really investigate Thingiverse to see what others have done. And then they take that information, they absorb it, maybe they print it, and maybe they say there's a flaw in this and I think I can make a design, I can make a design better. So there's there's fantastic opportunities there still using Thingiverse or any other file repository to start that crunching process that what do I need to do to make it better and, and I think that that really is relevant to to middle school education is looking at what's been done why doesn't it work or how can I make it better and again design and create the creativity aspect of this just just flourishes all right so into the uh, alongside the middle school years you know um, paralleling you know technology courses um, we still have you know lots of 3d printing in in the science areas and what's happening there is is basically presentations and again we sort of have steer students towards more of the um, investigating files um, through file repositories and bringing them forward 3d printing them uh, becoming aware of that process but not actually having the design skills but actually having an object that is um, ready for display or, or um, uh, I guess it um, uh, it they can use these objects alongside their normal presentation, their posters, those sort of things. And there are, you know, as you become more familiar with your 3D printer and its capabilities, um, there's a lot of software um, niches that allow 3D prints that are not structurally um, tested. They're not. They're not fitting objects. They're not holding objects. They're not um, working parts. They're just simply display models to actually just do the outside and leave the the inside hollow, minimizing your material um, use, um, reducing the amount of time that it takes to print. And um, students in those other courses, like sciences, gravitate to this. They gravitate to the fact that I can quickly grab something and 3D print it very quickly, leave it overnight, come back the next day, and I've got an object that will complement, that was the word I was looking for earlier, complementing my presentation. So there's um, great space happening there. And, and you know, we've got a, a student down here with a, with a praying mantis, and it just reminds me of a, my little girl's um, um, three-year-old present, uh, sorry, grade three presentation on on um, uh, fleas, and so she was able to 3D print a you know about a, a 200 mil by 200 mil flea. So we were able to find a, an STL file and we scale it quite large, and that was a very effective presentation model for the other students in the the class to understand what she what her presentation was all about. Middle school robotics. Now this is a very interesting space, and this space is is sort of it, it runs congruently alongside maybe maker maker spaces. A lot of maker spaces around the world are are public or community maker spaces are using schools and their 3D printing labs to come in and and um, create and, and design and test their ideas. But um, with the middle school robotics, certainly there's um, so much room in this space. And one particular um, uh, pro uh, project that uh, I work with uh, uh, in, a, on a, in a community level but out of school with is the one on the left there. It's called an InMove project. And now this is a – now they're developing the lower torso, but it, it has been previously just an upper torso fully – mobile, mobile um, humanoid robot. It's an exoskeleton, but all of the hands move 
um, the heads move. You can integrate um, Arduino microcontrollers for all of the movements, including the fingers, shoulders. And it also has voice, um, voice uh, recognition. And um, you can integrate a whole bunch of different sensors onto this, this project. This is a project that, for example, runs from the middle school all the way through to the senior school and involves multiple um, individuals bringing in their skill sets. So junior uh, middle school students getting into the 3D printing and customizing and, and understanding really at this stage, you know, when we're talking about a, a fully functioning robot, um, that is humanoid size, we need to understand the expansion, contraction, and capabilities of the materials that are 3D printed quite effectively because this, this thing does weigh quite a bit. So students really get to understand how they can strengthen these objects through design, through adding um, internal material, braces, that sort of thing. It's really an effective project for that. The more senior students also do 3D printing and customizing 3D prints, uh, but they're also working on the, the control side of things, which is a, a pretty neat addition. And it complements through the 3D printing because the, the students say, I need, I've got this Arduino controller, it needs a housing, it need, it's got this size. The junior students are responsible for designing and making the housing and making it fit within the compartment that is that it's limited to. So there's a lot of collaboration in this space, and um, the InMove project is just a wonderful project. What makes it fantastic is um, if you just go to um, InMove.com, uh, uh, a gentleman named Gael from France has developed all of the STL parts. The every single part and they're all available for free and so from the for the upper torso fully sized humanoid robot to be made and integrated with the control mechanisms the servo motors uh, and all of the 3d printing the exoskeleton we just finished that whole project and it was six hundred dollars for all the parts and the 3d printing for material cost and so, you know, stuff like that is just a, that's a very inexpensive, uh, uh, but the, the, the educational benefits are, are amazing. And you get students collaborating from, you know, junior to senior school students. And, and then there's your basic robot features, you know, there's some, especially on Thingiverse, like the bottom, the, the little remote control robot things, getting students to understand and, and print out their already existing, maybe not, not their own design, but an existing uh, platform to house their controllers and then learning more about the control, but being involved in that 3D printing process. It's fantastic. It's a really neat and uh, energizing space. The, uh, along with the middle school technology, certainly we have uh, a lot of machines. Their introduction to simple machines and devices. Again, uh, I can't uh, I can't endorse Thingiverse enough in that in the way that it inspires students to think about something different, and a lot of students you know they're stuck and uh, the books just don't do it. But when you have a physical model that they can put their hands on and look and study and understand how this mechanism works. They, they really start to develop an, a better understanding of how something can be improved. And so we do a lot of simple machine uh, projects with students in which a lot of them are you know, like a, a wrench uh, system and then students get into making and designing their own. Um, and, and we see this in, in the everyday market. We see the adaptation of tools. There's always a new tool coming out that or a machine or a device or a gadget. There's innovation everywhere. And we start this process quite early with the middle school um, students. So, so we start getting into some, some of the more senior schooling and I'll, I'll just particularly focus on the engineering part just because I, I am doing a project right now which involves students developing their own aerofoils and looking at strength and uh, strain testing and performance testing on their uh, using a wind tunnel. 
this is just an example of how 3D printing is is extremely effective in moving students quickly into this learning space. For example, previously these would be shaped using balsa wood, all right, and a very very delicate, um, easily shaped. But unless you have very very refined hand skills using tools, um, it's quite difficult to get that shape. Whereas in, in 3D printing, the students uh, can design very easily, study the, the aerofoil design, design their own, and extrude that pattern in 20 minutes, and then give it its internal strength characteristics. And uh, it, by, by the next day, they can have the three or four full-size 300 millimeter um, aerofoil samples ready to go. That's the next day. How many days are you spending shaping, you know, sanding, smoothing, trying to get that perfect consistent shape? Uh, it, it's This is a very time effective um, tool and there's for, for us, uh, myself, uh, in, in the engineering studies uh, that I do with the robotics and the engineering mechanics, um, there's there's no going back. I find that, that the time that it allows is for the students to be more effective in capturing data, analyzing data, doing the testing, rather than spending the time working on shaping and that sort of thing. It, it, it's moving into a new space that allows much more time because, as we know, students are very time constrained. Um, they've got a lot of subjects and um, on the go, and, and we, we really need to be very effective and efficient with our time um, in our teaching and learning time. So these are, are very effective. 3D printing has just revolutionized this engineering space. And then we get into, you know, and in, in Victoria, certainly, down, down in Victoria, systems engineering is an independent um, course, and it, and it is certainly an integration of electronics and mech, mech, mechatronics, basically, the, in, the, the integration of electronics and, and mechanics. And with this space, 3D printing has just revolutionized um, the course content in which students are now opened up. And I just draw your attention to Easton Lesha. Pell on, on the, uh, the right hand side there. There's a student there. He was, uh, when this picture was taken, he was uh, 17 years old. In uh, He comes from Colorado, small town, and he just loved electronics and loved 3D printing. He now, um, he works for NASA, and he now does these fully remote control robotic arms. If you just sort of type in his name on, on Google, Easton Lachapelle, you'll, you'll find a lot of information on his history and what amazing stuff he's doing. He was offered a lot of money to put his, um, to commercialize his product, which was a fully, um, sort of like a cyborg hand, whatever movements he made on his hand uh, activated. They're all 3D printed parts, the whole housing, everything. Offered a lot of money to commercialize his product and he said no, he wanted to put it out there for free. So those files are available as well. So if you've got sort of a long-term project that you want to look at it for the senior students, that's certainly something that involves um, tremendous experience in 3D printing and also the electronic side of things. But the whole that the whole movement towards quadcopters and that whole integration, lightening up um, of flying devices because we've got such amazing batteries, such amazing uh, controllers, microprocessors, and the skills to, to control these objects and the sensors that are used for balancing. Now we start seeing movement into more of, okay, I can start making my own housing, my own blades, and my own um, mechanics, my own gear systems, customizing these things. It's, it's a fantastic space as well. So I'm really excited to be involved in this and, and just watching it uh, come to fruition. The, the whole 3D printing involvement in this uh, the systems engineering space. Let's move on down to this next slide here. This is um, this is one project that um, I was asked to participate in at a school level. Um, certainly, geography and, and architecture. I'll just focus on the geography at this stage. 
Um, this is a really interesting space, and I'll, I'll point you again in the direction, the, the bottom picture, the gray sort of picture of, uh, that's Grand Canyon, is an extremely accurate representation of the Grand Canyon. And I'll point you in the direction of, of Thingiverse, again, and a gentleman named Shape Spear. He's, he's pretty clever, this guy. And he has a process in which you can, if you just get onto Thingiverse and you go through uh, the file um, repositories that he's got, that he's made, he also has a link to some tutorials, and um, tutorials on how to capture data from satellite or LIDAR data, so airplane uh, LIDAR data, capture, taking captured data, which is a free process, and running it through a conversion process to get it to an STL. How this is uh, um, taking shape in, in one of the schools that I'm working with a teacher uh, on in their geography course is that up here on the Sunshine Coast we do have in the, the Budrum Hills and the mountains um, there is a, a problem with um, rainwater, um, dispensing of the rainwater, and it does it does pool into the valleys quite quite a bit. And the um, the council is always looking for innovation and ideas to to move this water along. Because uh, I would say that there were probably three or four days lost this year just due to to rain. So in in the schools just due to flooding. What the students are doing in this space is they have LIDAR, they managed to, to acquire the LIDAR data of the entire mountain range, and they converted that to an STL file. They section off, so it's quite a bit, quite a large range, and some of these, these files that you need to do testing and analyzing need to be quite large. So the students have sectioned off, and there's, there's other software if you have some questions about software using to slice STL files up to get your best or most effective um, larger scale 3D printing models that won't fit in the 3D printer. There's, there's several methods to do that and we can talk about that later. But they've sectioned off many multiple sections and then they, they glue them together. And they have a, a, a very effective, very accurate model, three-dimensional model of the whole region. And they run fluid dynamic testing to watch how the water moves down into the valley and where it starts to pool and what a fantastic learning experience to, well it involves 3D printing but they had to do no design work, they were only doing file conversion work, but an experience in which they're able to take their own community problems and, and start solving and, or look for and investigate solutions. I think that modeling of landscapes is going to be a very big space in the, the, the future in geography classes. Certainly the architecture is, uh, is a fantastic space. The miniaturization all the way up to, like I said, um, scaling and slicing your models so that you can maximize and, and scale up your models to get big prints and then you have big city landscape features. Um, we do do quite a bit of that as well. Um, and then you've got your um, terrain mapping as well. Um, one of the projects in one of the schools just down the road um, has uh, students developing 3D printed models of national park systems in order to um, uh, design new trail systems and looking at sensitive areas, mapping out sensitive areas and, and designing new trail systems through those national park systems and state parks. That's a fantastic learning space as well. It does come down to, um, you know, a lot of these spaces that involve acquiring 3D printing technology, you know, it, it primarily has been the responsibility or the, the drive has always come from the technology area. But certainly what we see now in, in North America and in Europe, and it's starting to take shape a lot in, in Australia here, um, is library resource centers. So the, the, the fact that a student can, does, does not necessarily have to be a tech student 
or understand 3D printing uh, technology, uh, design skills, slicing skills, scaling skills. Um, they merely have uh, an object that they wish to print. And the library as a resource center is certainly a, a very big focal point for that. And what we're seeing is a lot of um, well, the, the more professional upper end 3D printers um, taking that space. Just because um, you know we're looking at um, librarians, we're looking at um, library staff having to manage the the type the, the 3D print. We're ha they're having to manage maybe the scaling of the item, the, the 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 fitting of the item, the costing of the item, the object that's being built. So it needs to be as seamless and easy a process as it would be for them to manage their own paper printers, which is, is, is quite, quite easy these days. So certainly you do start to see the library resource centers acquiring more of the higher end 3D printers just because they are very easy to use and they do involve that dissolvable support system where it's a chemical bath, uh, dissolve, we, when, if you have some questions on that support structure in 3D printing, uh, in order to in order to create those um, those overhangs or those internal structures that are you know weaving across different dimensions, they need to be supported somehow. And so, 3D printers, as as do the desktop printers, they they create that support so the objects can be built higher and higher and higher. Well, um, on the desktop 3D printer range, you certainly um, are in there physically, which is a great thing for students to get in there with their tools and their cutters and their files and shape and sand and smooth and remove that material. It's a very labor intensive process, but we need to remove that from the, from the educational resource center, the libraries, because uh, staff aren't going to do that. So the, the fact that you move into that space where the 3D printers are now um, making the object and they make it brilliantly. Um, the, the resolution is much, much finer. Um, the volume tends to be much bigger. Um, the consistency of the prints are, are much better, meaning that their, their layering is consistent across um, the height of the build. Those sort of issues are, are certainly managed very well. But the fact that the, the librarian or the, the library staff or the technician simply removes the model drops it into a tank of liquid um, and then that, that tank stirs a liquid which reacts to the support material and it removes that support material chemically and uh, the, the library then pulls out the model and hands it over to the customer or the student or whatever and, and, and there's of course fees, fees accordingly. The nice thing about the, the more higher end uh, models in, in, the, this, in the examples here shown um, certainly are their, um, their networking capability but also their management of, of their, their cost so you can quite easily um, understand what the cost and, and assign that to that student so before they before they commence the print so the students are very aware that this is what's going to cost them and to take on that cost the school to take on that cost is, is certainly at this stage is, is not practical not I don't think any schools do it from what I've what I've heard, um, students do own that cost. But the tool is there for them to use if they so choose and they don't have to be associated with, uh, with, the, um, with the school technology department. And then lastly, as, as we sort of move into uh, and leaving that space, that sort of um, secondary, that middle and primary, middle and, and secondary space, we, we, we hopefully steer students into these spaces in university where these um, 3D printing is, is really taking, taking hold and taking shape as well. Uh, they seem to be moving along um, very uh, complementary, uh, meaning there's, there's not, uh, I see, especially at you know, Queensland University, uh, Sunshine Coast, 
there's uh, a lot of that 3D printing technology um, available for those students who graduate with that interest in mind. I'm going into engineering, I want to do some material science, I'm going into fashion and arts, and so they're able to seamlessly move into university and they still they can still use the skills and, and increase those skill sets that they've acquired. So a lot of the, the, the stuff that we start seeing is certainly the fashion and arts industry, um, the making of dresses, um, the, the garment industry, the, the shape, the design, the creativity, and, and Australia is, this is a hot market, uh, the fashion industry in Australia, so this uh, we see a lot of that taking shape. Uh, the medical and dental implant uh, technologies uh, using some very high-end 3D printers, uh, as Dominic uh, probably mentioned, into the quarter of a million dollars worth, but certainly developing and designing custom implants uh, for uh, surgical procedures. Um, research robotics, 3D printing goes hand in hand with students working and graduating on from that systems engineering environment uh, into their mechanical or mechatronics or electrical engineering. They, uh, the 3D printing range of products that are available for them in universities doing research robotics is pretty incredible. But you know, down on the right hand side there is, is, is a really interesting, and I've talked about this before, um, teaching models. There's um, a very easy and a very free process in which if you can obtain MRI scans, it's a very easy process of converting those scans over. So for example, on the right hand side, we have an MRI scan of the internal, well the entire heart, and so we have both internal geometries and the external geometries very detailed with an MRI scan. And it's quite a big file, and the, the process isn't long because it's difficult and arduous. The process is long because there's a lot of number crunching. But uh, we can talk about that. There's a, there's a couple processes involved in which you can convert MRI or CT scan data into an STL file. And in this case here, we see a very detailed heart. And this would be an exact replica of, of the patient's heart. So you can actually discern or, or diagnose anomalies within, as we can see, the cut section of that 3D printed model. So teaching models in this space are um, very effective in that they can be immediately 3D printed from scan data acquired from a patient, which is fantastic.